Okay, tonight we are looking at Deuteronomy. Before we get going, are there any questions about the book of Deuteronomy or anything we talked about so far? No? Okay. Uh, so this is the last book of Moses. Um, obviously he dies in it. So, oh, sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> he dies in it. <laughs> uh, this, <laughs> chronologically, ha chronologically, it's really interesting because you know, when I was a kid, I read through the books of Moses, and I didn't really see this until I got older. But it, they each pick up after the other one. You know, I, like Leviticus, you don't realize that this is, chronologically speaking, in between Leviticus and Numbers, you just think, oh, it's a bunch of laws. But there's like, you know, there's a whole story to it. Um, and so Deuteronomy, it picks up, you know, right where Numbers left us, outside the promised land, just waiting. And uh, the, the law, uh, through, in Deuteronomy, the law is kind of, um, think of it as a refresher for the next generation. Um, it, it's something where a lot of the stuff that's, that's being talked about in Deuteronomy was talked about specifically in Exodus, but also in Leviticus and, and Numbers a little bit too. Um, it's just that it's kind of a refresher. Uh, because, so this is what happened. The last generation, the one that saw all the things in Egypt, they, they're dead now. So it's their kids that are taking over and going to the thing, so they need something a little bit extra. So the question, um, the question becomes, uh, I think, twofold. The first question we can ask is, why not just have the children, th this next generation, why not just have them read the law that was already written? Why not just go have them read Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers? Why write an entire new book for the new generation? Why? And the answer is because it was reestablishing it for a new generation. Just kind of reestablishing. Uh, another thing is um, Israel was literally waiting for people to die. Their progress into the promised land was literally being held up, waiting for people to die. And in Deuteronomy, the last person to die was Moses. And so everyone is stuck in a limbo waiting for the guy to die. <laughs> And so here's the bad news. <laughs> Deuteronomy says um, that he still had, you know, ba basically he was still youthful. He wasn't like a hunched up old man. He was still strong and capable. And so you have to wonder what everybody was thinking. Like, we have to wait for this guy to die, but it's nowhere in sight. <laughs> He's never going to die. <laughs> and uh, so then the question, the same question becomes, why, if, the, if, if they went to the trouble, if Moses went to the trouble and Joshua went to the trouble of, writing an entire book for the next generation, Deuteronomy, why did they not, why did it not have to be repeated for every generation? If they had to give a refresher to the law to the next generation, why didn't they have to do it for the generation after that, or the generation after that, or so on and so forth? And uh, two things. First off, Deuteronomy was supposed to be read every seven years. Every seven years, they were supposed to read it to the entire, all people, all the people of Israel. They were all supposed to gather together, read the whole thing from beginning to end. So it was supposed to be refreshed. The second point I want to make is uh, the previous generation, so the, the original generation, had lost out on their inheritance because of their sin. This next generation, their kids... They, they were s being set up to gain the inheritance that their parents missed out on. And then, once they had inherited it, it would be theirs. So they wouldn't have to keep re-inheriting it. So there'd be no reason to keep writing the law for the, for the next generation over and over again. It would be a thing that wasn't necessary because they already inherited it. It is important to note, though, that the, um, that the kings were supposed to write it out. They were supposed to write copy it, you know, and write it out so that way uh, they would, you know, kind of help them internalize it. Um, it was also kind of symbolic, the Deuteronomy was. Um, you know, Moses is getting ready to die, and so he's kind of handing the reins off. These are my last words, the things I really want to impress on you. And so it's kind of a, there's kind of a symbolic uh, element there as he's, as he's handing it off. Um, in, in the book of Moses, I'm sorry, in the book of Deuteronomy, it records the passing of Moses, uh, a very important point, especially from you know Israel's standpoint, uh, 
And the interesting thing about Moses, though, is that he's buried by God, which is, you know, this is kind of a singular event. I believe it's the only person that God ever personally buried. And um, it's just one of those things, that it's one of those details that is kind of important. But, uh, so I'm sure all of you guys will remember, uh, Moses is not allowed to enter the Promised Land because of some things that happened in the book of Numbers. And so he, he's not allowed to enter. But after he died, he did enter. And he met with Jesus on the mount in the book of Matthew. So he did eventually get to set foot in the promised land. It just took a lot longer than he originally planned. <laughs> uh, okay, so Deuteronomy, what does it mean? Uh, the word Deuteronomy, once again, this comes to us through the Greek. A lot of our names for the Bible do not come to us from the Hebrew. They come to us from the Greek. And Deuteronomy is no, no, no different. Uh, it comes down and basically means second law, which makes sense because it's like a reiteration of the law. Um, the problem with that, though, is it might kind of give you the idea that it's a contradiction to the original law. It's not. Um, there are some things that change throughout the books of the law. Some of the laws are a little bit different. Um, I'll leave that to you to because it's fun to kind of find these things out for yourself and then to figure out why did they change. Uh, so I'll leave that to you guys. But uh, if you ever are, are looking that up and you see kind of some differences between Deuteronomy and the rest of the books of the law, remember that we have the question box and we can always turn it into a group discussion. Uh, the Hebrew, though, they didn't call it Deuteronomy. They didn't call it second law. They called it Devarm, which basically means the words. Uh, and like most names of Hebrew, it's in, in the Hebrew, it's not overly that uh, imaginative. It's talking about the words that Moses recorded. <laughs> these are these are the words that Moses recorded. So, yeah, <laughs> kind of not that <laughs> original. <laughs> uh, we d Deuteronomy we can date very close to uh, when it was actually written because of the way it was written. So, as I mentioned, the actual Exodus event happened in the 1500s. Well just after the 1500s, it was like 1480s. Uh, and, but then Deuteronomy, what we don't, the form of Deuteronomy, the final form of Deuteronomy, we, the one that we have in our Bible, wasn't written until the 1200s. So the pro, uh, what we know happened, because we can just kind of piece things together here, Moses wrote it, Joshua edited it, but then later around the time of the judges, they put it in its final form. So they just kind of made it more um, standard. And the, the interesting w way we can date this is because they actually use the Hittite format, and it falls exactly into how they made their legal treaties. So uh, it, it's very helpful for us to be able to date things, just like a lot of times the, the names of different people can help us date uh, when a certain thing w text was, was written because we know when those names were common. It's very interesting. But anyways, um, so what happens in the book? Uh, it's pretty much Moses talking. Uh, Moses encourages the people who he is leaving behind. That's that's pretty much all that happens. There's not w uh, much else. That ha uh, there, there's no forward progression. They're still in the same spot they were at the end of the book of Numbers. Uh, what's the name, main theme of Deuteronomy? Now this this is a little bit harder to say. Um, Deuteronomy's main theme is different from all the other books of the law because it focuses more on the conditional status of the law. If this, then that. Um, so basically, blessings for obedience. If you obey me, these are the blessings that will come to you. And curses for disobedience. If you don't do what I'm telling you to do, I'm telling you it's not going to go well for you in the promised land. So it's kind of a long list there. Um, maybe you could say, uh, <coughs> maybe you could say part of the main theme is God's covenant with His people, but that's kind of general. Um, uh, that is a, a unique factor about the Bible is this whole covenant aspect that God would say, okay, we are entering into an arranged agreement together. It's a treaty. We are, we are entering into a treaty together. This is something that, that, that really is singular to uh, Yahweh. It's singular um, to the Bible. It's a very interesting aspect that um, I think a lot of times we overlook, especially people who grew up in the church overlook it. Uh, it's a very singular thing. I hope someday that we'll talk about it more in detail. But anyways, um, so I think the main theme of Deuteronomy is kind of just the conditional status of the law. Um, there's a lot of blessings and curses contrasted, and the, and things are repeated, but but from the law, but uh, it's kind of organized in a way that just makes it more. I don't know. I think it flows better. 
Um, Deuteronomy is, is singular as far as the books of, the Mos- of Moses because it's much more personal and much more heart in it than in the rest of the law. Whereas in like Leviticus, you'll go through kind of these dry verses after dry verses. Deuteronomy has this, has this thing that it does that makes the law more um, emotive, more uh, personal um, than the other law books. And so because of that, there's going to be two main themes that kind of just piggyback on each other, and that's love and fear, love of God and fear of God. And so you just kind of see this kind of repeat over and over again. Love in, in Deuteronomy, love is more, um, it's more than feelings, and fear is also more than terror of punishment. In Deuteronomy, and love isn't just, oh, have, have warm fuzzies for God. And fear in Deuteronomy isn't to, ah, be terrified of God. It, the, both of those things are, are not really focusing on the emo- emotional aspect of them so much as it is the, the response to them. So let me say that, say that like this. Love in Deuteronomy is more obedience. And Jesus hints on this when he says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Um, it, it's kind of the same in the book of Deuteronomy. Love in Deuteronomy is kind of with the implication of obedience. But then you get to fear, and fear in the book of Deuteronomy is kind of being considerate of God with your ways. So when we think of fear of God, sometimes we're going to think something along the lines of, I am afraid of God. But in Deuteronomy, fear of God is more like, I believe in God, I trust in God, therefore it changes how I live. Because I know that there is God watching. I know, not that he's watching to punish, but I know that he's real, I know that he's there. And so if you fear God, you live in consideration of him. You respect and honor him. It's, it's something like that. Um, Love answers what you do, you obey God. Fear answers why you do. Uh, if, I am living in sum, uh, um, if I am living in submission to him, considering my ways before him, that is the fear of the Lord. So it's kind of, both of them are, are, are important. Love answers what you do, fear answers why you do. And it's just kind of this idea of, um, in all my ways, I'm acknowledging him, I'm thinking about him, that's living in the fear of the Lord. It's, it's something that, that I think you really have to spend some time thinking about. Um, it, it just gets confusing if you just try to talk about it because it's, like, I feel like I've said the same thing three times, but it's just, I still don't feel like I'm getting across the thought that I'm trying to get across. So, uh, anyways, uh, maybe someday I'll think of a better way to word it. The outline of Deuteronomy is very cool, very cool. Um, it, it, it's outlined by something called a chiasm. I, I've mentioned this before. Uh, I think it was in the Bible class I did last year. But a chiasm basically has where there's a central theme, and so it starts and ends on the same point. Think of point A, and, and the first and last one is A and A. And then the next one, chapters 4 and 11, and chapters 3 and 7, that would be like B and B. And then the chapters 20, 12 through 26, that would be like C. So it has like this this half of an X, and it kind of builds towards the middle thing. So the the book starts with a look backwards. This is think of this as like the outer frame of the book. This is where we came from, and it ends with kind of a look forward. Hey, this is where we're going. You know, it talks about uh, you know uh, the song of Moses and Moses dying and Joshua taking and taking over and all that stuff. That's 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 at the end. It's talking about what's coming next. But then uh, after you get past the look backwards, you get to chapters 4 through 11, and that kind of just gives a summary of the covenant. Um, very important, but now you're getting into kind of like an inner frame of the book. And this is matched by how it ends in chapters 27 through 30 by a covenant ceremony. This is where they're actually, the covenant that they've been talking about through the whole book and in Exodus, they actually have a whole ceremony for it. Um, and when they get into the promised land in Joshua, they're going to have something there too, but We'll get to that later, uh, next week. Uh, and so then the main heart of the, of the book is chapters 12 through 26, where he gives covenant stipulations. This is the very core. And he was talking about obedience, uh, I'm sorry, about uh, blessings and curses and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, uh, very important stuff. So the question becomes, so what? Why, why does it matter that Deuteronomy is in our Bible? Uh, Deuteronomy is quoted throughout the Bible. It, it, it's probably the single most, uh, I guess you could say, foundational book of the Bible. Um, all, a lot of other books depend on it. The prophets depend on it. The, the history books depend on it. I mean, everything depends on it. Uh, it. It's one of those books that's just extremely important. It's quoted just an, a phenomenal. You remember when Jesus is being tempted by Satan, and he says about uh, man cannot live on bread alone? That's from Deuteronomy. 
That, that's from Deuteronomy. Remember when the guy asked Jesus, he says, hey, uh, what's the most important law? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. That's Deuteronomy. Again, it's Deuteronomy. Um, all, all the different things that, that people think of when they think of the law, the quotable parts, it's always Deuteronomy that they, that they talk about. Um, it, it's, it's, so for that, it's very important. Another thing about Deuteronomy is it points to the Christ a lot more than the rest of the law. All the law points to the Christ, especially in essence. But Deuteronomy says some things that are very pointedly t- about the Christ. Uh, for instance, it's in Deuteronomy that, that, that Moses writes, there's going to be another prophet after me, and he's going to take you there. It's in also in Deuteronomy where he says, one of these days, you guys are going to ask for a king. Let me tell you a couple things about kings. And then he says a couple things that they shouldn't do, right? And then in uh, first Kings, it goes through and details how Solomon does all the things that Deuteronomy says that a king shouldn't do. And he does it, even does it in the order, too. Very important points. This is all Deuteronomy. It's a very important <laughs> book to the Bible. Um, uh, it also points, uh, it also, Deuteronomy also uh, makes the law more personal and more relatable. Um, it, it's like the whole thing, I, I just quoted it about the whole Man can't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from God. That's, that's Deuteronomy. And, and think of how personal that wording was. Did you remember reading that in Leviticus? No, you don't, because it wasn't in Leviticus. Uh, Deuteronomy does a lot of stuff like that, where it just a lot m- makes it a lot more uh, for you. You know what I mean? So think of it as Deuteronomy is the everyday person's law. <laughs> and Leviticus is kind of like the snobby person's law. <laughs> uh, I kid, I kid. Um, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy was also very important to Israel's history uh, because it acknowledged their past and their failures, uh, but it also gave direction for their future. And it was something that they kept leaning back towards. Um, in uh, Kings, there's a part where they are renovating the temple and they find a copy of the law. That's Deuteronomy they found. See what I mean? Like, it, 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 wherever you, it, you always see Deuteronomy cropping up over and over again. So, uh, let's see what else. Deuteronomy is interesting because Deuteronomy pointed out that there was more than just the law and that the law wasn't the end game. And it kind of pointed forward to the need of something more. And when you read through Deuteronomy this year, I want you to think about all the things that Jesus said, and then go through the book of Deuteronomy, and you're going to see a lot of things that just kind of hop out to you while you're reading. Like, ah, God knew what he was doing. How about that? Uh, I mean, we we know that, but sometimes when we're reading the law, we just kind of forget that. We, ah, you know, this is like God was God was living his like crazy youth years or something, and he just kind of lost sight of the end game, so he gave us the law. But it's not really like that. It's one of those things where it's like, no, he had an end game the whole time, and this was part of that end game. He was working towards it the whole time. And if you go to it with the understanding of, 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 of Matthew, Matthew especially, and then you read through Deuteronomy, it's like, oh, okay. So this is pointing out to the coming Messiah. This prophet, that's the Messiah. This, th- this here, that's why the law is not good enough. Stuff like that. So just, just check it out. It's, it's, it's definitely um, probably the easiest uh, book of the law to, to get into. Uh, Deuteronomy also talks a lot about do this that you might live. It's like a pleading, uh, like begging for somebody to listen. And in that aspect, it shows the heart of God more so than I think a lot of the other laws. Because in, in the other laws, God is revealing his heart, but we don't really get that when we're, when we're reading the other laws. We just kind of think, oh, this is boring. Uh, this seems pointless. Uh, this has to do with the tabernacle. Well, they, why do I even read this? This has to do with how many people lived in each family. Why do I care about this? But in, 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 this, in this part, y- you kind of see Moses pleading with the people, do this that you might live. And uh, it really shows the heart of God. It shows his compassion. And uh, it, de- it shows his desire to restore. Because he's telling all these, thing- all these things to the people knowing that they're going to do it anyways. Think about that. He knows what they're going to do. He knows the rest of Israel's history. He knows what's coming. And he gives them this warning from the very get-go, not setting them up for failure, but encouraging them, and even says, hey, if you do this, you will be blessed. Good things. But it just evidently wasn't enough uh, for them. 
So that takes us to something that is kind of important. Uh, next week we're going to start talking about the books of history, which takes us all the way from Joshua to Nehemiah. Somewhere around there. Um, chronologically, Nehemiah would be the last one. It's funny, in, in, in Hebrew, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah is one. Is one. In, in English, we have it separated into two, Ezra and Nehemiah. It's one of those things that blows me away. Uh, but in the history, there's um, the Deuteron... This is a hard word here, okay? Deuteronomistic history. Yes, you ha- you will be quizzed on that. I want you to be able to write it out three times in, f- in two minutes. Go ahead. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, basically, what that big scary word means is that there are some of the books of Israel's history which has a very strong influence from the book of Deuteronomy. That's all that it means. Okay, I know it sounds terrible. It's even worse to look at. <sighs> but uh, it, it's, not, it's not anything crazy. So there are some books of, of the history, b- books of Israel's history, that are very strongly influenced by the book of Deuteronomy. Joshua, obviously. Obviously. Uh, it records Joshua leading the people into the promised land. Judges. Uh, which records the time between uh, Joshua dying-ish and uh, the time of the kings. Well, I should say the chieftains because Saul really wasn't a king. He was more of a chieftain. Uh, and then it, takes, it goes through Samuel, which records once again the last of the judges and uh, Saul starting and uh, David. And then kings, which records everybody after that until the fall of the southern kingdom, which is mm, brain farting here. So the north fell in 722, so the south fell in 586. So it goes through 586. And um, uh, all those books that you're going to read, they're going to have a very strong influence uh, from Deuteronomy. In fact, if you want uh, something kind of interesting, uh, read Deuteronomy and then read Kings, and I think you'll get a lot more out of it. Uh, when you start connecting those books together. Uh, Because Kings is very much so um, influenced by Deuteronomy. But anyways, uh, um, Deuteronomy was Israel's constitution. If you want to think of it like in some modern terms, it will really help you. Deuteronomy was the constitution. It was something that um, it really uh, uh, was always um, at the root of of what's going on. And they, they tried to get away from it. They tried to, you know, whatever. And the prophets kept pointing back to it. Oh, but what about the law? What about the law? And it really formed the nation. It, it, it made it something unique. See, some people argue, and I'm not going to take an argument on side on this because I just don't really care, but some people argue that America was founded as a, as a, as a non-Christian nation. Some people argue that it was founded as a Christian nation. Whatever your stake is on that, there are things that they did that they believed to be based on biblical principles, regardless of whichever side of the argument you take. But... For Israel, it wasn't like that. It wasn't they were forming a government and using parts of the Bible as, like, anchors. For them, the, the, their constitution, the book of Deuteronomy, was the anchor, and then everything else spawned from that. See, it's, 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 a whole, it's the idea of it's, it's an, an entirety of a um, God-focused thing, which is why it was so important when they established a kingdom and uh, kind of ousted God uh, from their midst, if you will. Um, but anyways, uh, our, as I mentioned, it applied the the other three law books kind of more personally. Um, the focus of Deuteronomy, though, is uh, if you want to read Exodus, where where the covenant is first given at the mountain, um, probably around chapter twenty or something. Uh, that's kind of Deuteronomy expands mostly on that. Um, that's kind of the main focus of it. Um, as far as the history books themselves, uh, they cover from the 1400s down to the 500s. That's a huge chunk of time uh, to summarize. Um, so after Moses was Joshua the Conqueror, then Judges. And here's the thing about the book of Judges, okay? It's going to give dates, but it's not in order. We really don't know how long the book of Judges went for. Uh, some of the Judges went at the same time, just in different areas. And so we can't really add the books, add the numbers up in Judges and get any kind of definite answer. We have no idea. 
Um, we know it was sometime around like the 1200s or something, but that's really all we know. Uh, let's see what else. Um, judge, and th then we get to the book of Judges, uh, where it mentions uh, Israel becoming more and more like the Canaanites. And then you get to the book of Samuel, which is a, a transition period for Israel, because they're getting rid of their last judge, Samuel, and uh, a chieftain takes his place, Saul. Uh, Saul was never really a king. Uh, he didn't ever have the full authority of all the tribes. Uh, he pretty much had a few that were under his under his rule, and then the other ones were kind of just like, eh, whatever. And uh, as far as the nation itself, they never really had a strong capital and a strong you know military and that kind of stuff. It was more of a chieftain. Uh, when David came, he, he kind of changed that a little bit. Um, he moved it to where there was a capital, which became Jerusalem, the city of David. Uh, and he did have a, a running military, and he made it where there were, um, you know, his 30 uh, mighty men and stuff. He actually established something, built, you know, kind of like think of it as a city hall. It's not a city hall, but it's kind of like the equivalent of it. Um, you know, and obviously it would be outdone by Solomon, but David was the one who really turned it from a chieftain into a more of a kingdom. And then, and then Solomon, uh, in the book of Kings, transitions it from, from a kingdom into a mini-empire. Um, and for some people, that might be hard to believe. But if you if you know your history of the ancient ancient Near Eastern world, there were this was actually the time of many empires. Solomon's was not the only many empire. There were a bunch of them around the area at the time. Uh, so this is not outside of the realm of, realm of like, oh, how can that be? The Bible is just making crazy stuff up. No, it's it's really not. Uh, most of the time, the Bible has actually given us details um, that have been proven to be correct over time. It just you know um, they've kind of been forgotten. There was actually a time when uh, people thought that the Babylonians uh, weren't even really a thing, that the Bible just made them up. And then, whoops, <laughs> they found a lot of stuff validating the Babylonians, including the Babylonians' records. So <laughs> little things like that that's like, well, maybe you shouldn't rush to say that the Bible is not historical if you don't actually know what you're talking about. <laughs> so anyways, uh, the Book of Kings transitions it to a mini-empire, and then it goes all the way through its mini-empire into a shrunken kingdom with its deterioration, and then all the way to it being a fallen state. Um, and that's kind of where it leaves off. And that, that's the books of um, Deuteronomist, Deuteron Deuteronomistic history. And then the regular books of history, you've got Chronicles, which is basically kings, but it only includes the good stuff, and it leaves out all the bad stuff. <laughs> and then you have Ezra and Nehemiah, which talks about them coming back from being in, in, you know, outside of their homeland. And then you've got Esther, which talks about uh, an event that happened during that time as well. Um, oh, and Ruth, I forgot Ruth is in there, uh, which talks about uh, David's ancestors. So that's pretty much all the books of history. Um, any questions on any of that? Because we're done for tonight, and we'll pick up with Joshua next week. Um, the rest of the books of the Old Testament, we're not going to be doing as in-depth as we did for the books of the law. The reason why I spent so much time on the books of the law is because they're probably the most neglected books in the Old Testament. I mean, everybody likes reading Isaiah. Who doesn't like reading Isaiah? Like, come on. Uh, people like reading Samuel. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Kings, I mean, hey, that's great. But you get to, like, Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, people just don't care. Like, it's, they, ah, I'll just read something else. I'll read Matthew over, over Leviticus. And it's like, well, I understand, but huge, huge oversight. So, okay, no questions? No? We're all good? Just kidding. <laughs> all right. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for tonight. Uh, help us to uh, help us to always be learners of your word, always be uh, ready to um, ready to seek you more and always to delve in more, Lord. Lord, we're asking that uh, throughout this week of services that we have an encounter from your Holy Spirit. That, um, Lord, you just you just touch our touch our spirits, touches in our hearts, and move us, Lord, to and change us. That uh, that we'd show us things that we didn't know. You would soften our heart towards towards your Spirit. You would lead us to places where we haven't gone that we would do things that we haven't done. We love you, Lord. Amen.